There we go. All right. So, as I had noted um, uh, in my you know opening minute or two here, um, products and co-products um, form uh, one of two of the most basic constructions we work with in category theory. They're super practical in general. They appear ubiquitously, and they also appear specifically in our. Um, they appear extensively in our centrally. Mm -hmm. Now, they also lay the groundwork for the next chapter, chapter 19. This is chapter 18. Chapter 19, which is talking about pullbacks, which relax some of the constraints on, on products, uh, can handle more general cases, and pushouts to lack it on co-products. They also illustrate products and co-products, some of the features of limits and co-limits, although so this become um, explicated in chapter 19 by, by using the chat. Um, and it turns out initial terminal objects also illustrated, but, it, but it's really brought out more in chapter 19. Um, it's brought out better as we're taking these limits of the diagrams that, that it arose with them. So I mentioned they're, they're ubiquitous, they're um, and the way I think of um, products is kind of canonical summaries of, of, of A and B. Uh, not quite quite the right way to, way to put it, but it's kind of one stop shop um, that um, uh, that that gives you uh, the um, uh, A information on A and information on B. And co-products are kind of canonical summaries of having uh, either an A or a B, but not both. Um, and roughly speaking, that's kind of how I might think about them. Um, uh, for products, we definitely have both. We can get both. And for co-products, we have one or the other, but not both. Um, and one thing to realize that I don't think Eugenia Chen really talks about in this chapter, I uh, may appear in other later chapters is when we're doing applied category theory, these pop up all the time in algebraic notation. And so products commonly appear as A cross B. That's what I'll be using here. But they also appear as like A, a star B or A, a B uh, next to each other. We're going to see this in polynomial functions, which is going to be the focus of, of some of our attention up to this course, um, uh, and possibly in the last lecture or two of this course. Um, Co-products are written as A plus B. Now, you may know that this notation reflects their name, right? Um, products are like products. Mm -hmm. And this is more than skin deep and set. Um, we will see that um, when we take one set and we take the product with another set, the number of elements, if we have a certain number of elements in A, call it, call that the cardinality of A, the number of elements in it. Um, and we have a certain number of elements in B, does anyone remember from the exercise I asked you to try? What's the number of elements in A cross B? A cross B? Yeah. 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 It's A times or A cross, right? B, right? Um, and it turns out that our co product, although I didn't ask you to, to undertake it. Co product, you're either getting an A or you're getting a B. You're, you don't know which, which one it is. You have elements of A, mark this coming from A, and elements of B, mark this coming from B. This is a set. Set here. Um, there, if, you're, if, you're, if you have A and B and you take the co product,
What number of elements do you think we, we have? A plus, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe this is immediately obvious to you, but but it's it's a nice fact that's reflected in kind of the names. Okay, and it's again, it's a lot more than skin deep. Um, it comes up all the time. So we'll 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 see this. So so um yeah, please. Right. Yeah. Right. And yes. Uh, That's right. Either from one or from the other, but not from both. Uh, the other formula, uh, A plus B, yeah. One, A, uh, yeah, this union, I think you're talking about. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so there's um, there's a notion of, so, so we're dealing with co products and set, we're dealing with uh, the disjoint union. We're not, we're not dealing with cases where like the same element is in both of them, you know, both of them A and B both have elephants in it. And, you know, because of that, the union, uh, the union doesn't have A plus B, but A plus B minus A intercept B. In category theory, remember, we're not talking about, we're, our focus is on relationships, focus on relationships and context. And we're not talking about um, the elements in each of these sets. And we're dealing here with what's called disjoint union, where even if the elephant is in each of them, it's it's elephant from A, it's an A elephant, or a B elephant, right? Maybe it's like an African elephant and an Asian elephant. They're, they're different elephants, right? Um, so, uh, so, yeah, here, uh, a lot of the math, that you're referring to, Nona, definitely uh, is 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 relevant, but we're dealing with disjoint union. Yeah. Now, um, or it's sometimes called tagged union. Tag, yeah. Yes, and I think you saw that in the. Yeah. Be loose tag. Yes. Yes. Um, that's right. So, uh, for products and set, I like to think of it as sort of a one step for holding information on on both the two sets. And this is a this is from uh, Brendan Fong uh, or David Spivak. I think it's from Brendan um, at this this MIT course whose link I provided earlier. But the idea is that you know we have so here's our our product A cross B, and we have a uh, these two projection morphisms, uh, inset morphisms are what? Inset morphisms are functions. And, and these A cross B is a set, uh, right? And A is a set. So these are functions mapping. Remember what functions do? Function from a set to a set maps each element, right? Each possible element of A cross B, it gives it a value of that, right? And each possible element of A times B, uh, A, A cross B, you know, the, the product maps to B. So these are functions that take, turns out, pairs, set of A and B's, and it starts the A, it starts the B. It, it sort of bundles information on A and B in the same thing. I think it uh, uh, keeps information on both of them. But it, it satisfies this universal property. This product has. Basically says for any contender, any guy you see that also has kind of similar morphisms down to A and B, or when I say similar, it has morphisms down to A and B, these functions F and G. Um, then what is this thing on the right? Do you remember? Well, this is a okay, so here's the product down here. There's, there's the product, and this is the contender. This is the would be the pretender for the throne, the would be um you know, saying, oh, I'm the best encoder. What is it that distinguishes this one here, uh, A cross B? It'll have a unique morphism that makes the outside triangles unique. Exactly, exactly. So you remember initial objects and terminal objects, 
right? Um, remember, we had unique morphisms from which one? From the initial, initial, initial object to any other object, right? It was a unique morphism, right? And terminal object had a unique morphism to it from every other object. Here, we have a unique morphism from every other what's called cone. So these are called cones, okay? They're called cones, these, these ones here. Um, category here likes these big things, and these are cones. And there's a category of cones, in case you see it in, in the book. There's a category of cones, which is kind of a funny concept. So each of the objects is a cone, and there's morphisms between them, right? Um, but these are cones, and so any any other way that can give you both A and B, any other C that can give you A and B through two morphisms has a unique morphism, a unique morphism to A cross B, hmm? a unique morphism. Uh, and and this, this is going to have uh, a really nice property. It's a unique morphism, it's actually not a unique morphism from C, it's not even a, any, merely a unique morphism from the cone uh, headed by C with F and G. Unique morphism for that cone that makes these triangles commute. In other words, makes it go, so you, you go with this morphism K and B, and then you go projection, you get the same thing as taking F. Or same thing to the right, um, is G is the same as taking H and then pi two. In other words, Given us the, you could all the information of relevance in the A in the C, the contender is given by A cross B, and um, and and you know given that unique way of getting the A cross B out of it, the product you can then take the the morphism. Um, yeah, please. So from C is not yeah, is not unique. Just from cone is it's it's from the cone involving the C. So great question. That's like an awesome question. It took me three years to ask that question. <laughs> so um three or four. Um uh, it's a great question. So it is actually not a unique morphism from C. C could have many such morphisms to A cross B. But it's unique morphism for each pair of A of F and G. Each cone rooted it because C can have several cones, right? It can have this cone and, and F and G, and it can have this one with J and K, and, or yeah. Um, and and each of those have to have the unique morphism to AB that makes these these triangles commune. These sort of Trying, right? Um, so let me unpack this a little bit more. So C is any object category equipped with F and G here. And um, so C together with F and G, um, uh, specifying F and G here from C. That's what they come from. Um, uniquely determines H. Okay. So each pair F and G. It just gives you a um, the information in F and G is the is same as is given by by H, and, and the terminology that's used and Eugenia Chang uses it quite quite a lot is that this cone from C is factorized, meaning this is kind of in some sense the the canonical one. It's the one that. Uh, it's the more basic one, just like we take a number and we divide it up into prime numbers. This is kind of like the more basic, the basic capturing of the way of abstracting A and B. Anything else is kind of, you can do it, but it's got extra props. Imagine if C, for example, were, um, uh, it had A times B times B. So it had an extra thing stuck in the end, right? There'd be several ways of, of, of mapping this, but they could all be reduced to this to get to the essence of it. This is like the essence. The A cross B is like the essence, the, the core of the information. Everything that C needs to extract it, the F and G is 
bundled together in A and B. So everything that F and G, F and G give is bundled up in H. For each F and G, you have an H. And, uh, and that factorizes this, this other term to a more basic thing, this product. Um, and uh, I will say that uh, the product summarizes information about A and B, but, but here, you know, um, for an arbitrary category, it's worth noting, instead, these are morphisms or functions. For an arbitrary category, they have to be things that, that are morphisms in that category. So they honor the structure of that category. Um, and uh, these projection maps are not necessarily uh, a unique uh, unique thing here. Um, many categories you can get the same product for many uh, A cross Bs. Um, sorry, you get the same A cross B for many, many different A's and B's here. So you might get, you know, the product, um, the same product might result from uh, several different, uh, several different uh, pairs of, of A and B that could be. Now, um, one thing I want to emphasize, and some observers emphasize this more, is that, like in many categories, and particularly tree orders and total orders, um, A cross B is like close to a A A and B here. It's like the closest upstream one. Anything else? Think of a free order where, like, these are like orderings where a link from C to A cross B means it's, it's you know, um, greater than it. This is like the closest one to these two. And when we say it factorizes, but other things go through it, A cross B is like closed down to it. It's the one just above A cross B. If we're further up, then if you have another C, it, it couldn't go up to it because it's in pre order and can only point down. So, so here, the fact that it's um, that it, it's linked to by every other object means in a lot of categories it's like the closest one to A plus B. All the others have arrows to it and that that go through it in order to get to A and B. All their information otherwise is bundled up in those arrows. Um, uh, it's like a filter. It's like um, this is on the way. It's like this is the, the you know all these other things have ways of getting A's and B's, but this is the most essential way. This is the most basic, the most um, parsimonious, the most um, the most sort of uh, uh, precise or condensed way of having it. It's like the the canonical way of, of doing it. Um, the yeah. you mentioned is that we have to uh, here we have to link just all uh, our models. We haven't linked it. We have all of these have to link just a and a that well any call any 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 object that has these morphisms to A and B any that that's like a, a pretender to be the throne. It's like the thing that can provide information on A and B. Anything like that for uh, FFG, it has to have a unique morphism to A cross B that kind of distills the information, boils down the information in F and G into the simple, you know, essence of it, the distillation of it, the parsimonious description of it, which is A cross B. So any other way we could get A and B, there, there's tons of them, right? You could store an element, you could store A, an element of A and an element of B, a big list, right? For the first 10 elements, it's A. The second 10 elements is B. But that's kind of wasteful, right? It's 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 not getting to the essence of it. It's not getting to the essential of it. A cross B is like getting to the essential of it. And the deal is that any other object for ways that can give you A and B, it can be boiled down to something that gives you an A cross B. Um, and, and that's all you need. Like F and G, all the information about them is, is packed in here, okay? Uh, is packed in A. 
Must be. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, check my understanding when we were talking about their uh, F and G don't have to be the only arrows. Uh, so, for example, if this diagram we had, oh, yeah. if we had F1 and F2 going from C to A, and then G1 and G2 going from right. C to B, would that mean that we need four unique H's from C to A cross B, one for each possible pair of arrows? Okay, so that's a, a really interesting question. I think actually. Well, so you could have a context like that, but you might also have for like F1 goes to the G1 and F2 goes to the G2. And you get out, um, they they kind of go together. I don't I don't know if, if it would always be all possible, like um could it be F1 and G2 and G and F2 and G1. I, I don't know that that's always the case. It, it could be in some circumstances, but it, maybe in others, there are just multiple pairs that that are coming from C that can also give you something from A and something from B. And it's any pair of those, that information is fully summarized in this product. Mm -hmm. And so you give me a product and I can give you all the information that you would otherwise give on on A and B um, just with this product because going with that and then projecting is the same as this and going with that projecting is the same as this. So it's the same information I would give you, but it's boiled down to A cross B. It's like that's my one handy place to go. So you remember category of set set functions. Let's talk about a set here. So with set, this is what it looks like. This is, should be pretty familiar. This is again from I think Brendan Baum in this, and again the, the links are uh, early on there. So if you have an arbitrary set of these, um, and you have an A, which is a, a category, uh, so a set, capital A, which is A and B, mm -hmm. and, a cap, and, a, and a set, capital B, which is one, two, three. This is what the the flavor you could be thinking about. So this is what A cross B looks like. It consists of these pairs. Remember, I one here, this is in set and functions between set, that category. So we have these morphisms, these projections or what? Morphisms in the category set are functions. So these are functions. So what is pi one doing? Well, each element of this set A cross B, what is its job? Each of them, its job is to map it to either A or B, right? So A comma three, what would that be mapped to? A. What would B comma two be mapped to? B, yeah, by pi one, right? That's kind of along this axis. That's what Brendan drew up that one. Along this axis, pi two, it's extracting what would it map a2 to? Oh, two. Two. What would it map a1 to? One. one. Yeah, so it's it's kind of extracting the, the second element, right? And the yeah, idea here is again, if you have an arbitrary set, maybe it's some fancy thing, it's a it's a list consisting the first bunch of elements or elements, you know, the first element. First 10 elements are all the same element of capital A, and the next 10 elements are all elements of, of capital B. There, there's lots of wastefulness. There's lots of needless duplication. It's not canonical. It's not the essence of it. It's not boiled down. And it's not just the essential information. There's lots of repetition going on. And what this is saying is, okay, given that element, right? Um, uh, and projection morphisms, maybe F takes the first of them and G takes the, the, the 11th of them or something like that, the, the first of the Bs, um, the 11th element in this list. Given that, there's a unique morphism to A cross B, which extracts the, the first and the 11th and, and gives you one of these. And that is guaranteed to commute. In other words, if you do that and then you project down, you get 
and maybe you extract A and then you project down and, and you extract an A here. Um, and over here, maybe it, it gives you a two. So you, you go here and it gives you A2 and, it, and you extract the two here and it's guaranteed to be the same. So A cross B here is a set of pairs, right? It's an object you can set, which is a set, right? Um, it's a set of pairs. I, I want to make sure no one thinks that it's not a, a pair with the first element having the whole set A and the second element having the whole set B. No, no, no. It's a, it's, it's a set of pairs. Each of them is a pair, right? Um, that bundles together information on A and information on B. Um, and to best find F and G uniquely determines it. If there's all these wasteful ones, they're going to have lots of these kind of cone, cone, cone sides uh, at the same C because there'll be different ways of mapping it down. And every one of them will have a way of doing it uniquely, of doing it in terms of a canonical representation instead of doing it in this wasteful way up here. Um, there's a bijection between F and G, therefore, on the one hand, an H. So any F and G to map to a specific H and vice versa. Um, and this is like saying if we extract an element, A cross B from C, it's the same as C determining a value of A and a value of B. It has the same information. Um, and uh, it's, it's not always fully unique. I mean, here, right, if you had, you had A being A and then B being empty set. What would you get to the sets here? The B is empty set and A is A B, let's say. Um, what would you get here? Okay, if this is empty set, then you would have to be the empty set. It would be the empty set because there's no there's no way we could get a second element. No, this guy is empty set. This guy is A B. Yeah, so these both give empty set. So remember, like from, for the first element here in each of these pairs, we need something from set capital A, right? For the second element in the pair, we need an element from some element from set capital B. I'm saying if that element were zero, or, or the empty set, if, if that set, that set were, were the empty set. So there's no, it's, there's no possibilities. You can't build one of these. You can't create it. You can't have something whose second element is from an empty set. And so this would be empty. It would be the empty set. And what I'm saying is that can also result if you had A being empty set and B being one, two, four, or one, two, three, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, or, or both being empty set. That's right. Now, the cardinality of that was said earlier. The cardinality is capital A, you know, the number of elements in A, number of elements in B, which is the problem, which, which is kind of nice, right? Um, uh, okay, but those are set. And before I do these examples, I want to again emphasize that it's often nice to think of this. Remember, you're thinking this factorizes it. Like all these paths um, from C, there's guaranteed to be something that goes through the product. It goes through it. It's downstream from C. Did you see that? Given an object. Now, this is true in the general construction of sets. A cross B is downstream of C. Do you see that? Um, it's downstream of it. It's and it's often kind of the closest one to A and A and B. It's like the one that everything else has to go through to get to A and B. Do you, you got that point? Like the closest one. So let's let's go to some examples. Um, so what is the product here in this category? So remember, um, product um, is on the kind of on the way to A and B. So, so uh, what what do you think uh, would serve as the product? So if we had 
F and F here, if we if it's set A or it's set A, if object A or N, remember product is a product of two objects, right? And set, it's two sets, but in general, it's two objects, object A and object B, right? We're looking for a cone, right? That, that is the universal cone. It's the grand cone, the glorious cone. Um, so it's the cone that that has an object. And often we'll we'll kind of informally say that's the that's that's the product, but it's really together with its projections, right? Um okay, so so product is product of two objects. So suppose they give you the objects F and F. What's their product? Okay, good. Yes, that's that's correct. So let's let's reason that through. Here, good good question. So remember we have this product structure. And uh when we have two objects, A and B, in this case, let's suppose they're pre-ordered that, right? So these could be F and F, or these could be T and F, but it's gonna be for a particular case of that, right? Because we're gonna have the product of in set, it would be like the product of set A and B is going to be one set, and the product of these other two sets would be this other set. So in general, it'll depend on particular objects, right? What the what the product is, right? And the product has to be upstream of both of them. It can't have morphisms like if it whatever objects. You know, sits in where A cross B is here. It's got to have morphisms to both the objects that you're that you're who of which you're taking the product, right? So, so I think we're comfortable with that. So, so let's equip by that knowledge. Let's go back to this. So now let's consider F and F. So we need an object. So for the case of F and F. We're considering a particular product, right? Um, it's as if we're, we're talking in set about the product of X, Y, and, you know, uh, as one set and another set, elephants and tree or something like that. That would be, you know, some particular set, right? So here, let's have one particular set, or like what particular object in this category is the product of capital, right? It's got to be a, it's got to be an object that has morphisms to both of those. It's got to be an object which has morphisms to F and 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 morphism to F. Right? Um, does F have morphisms to F and morphisms to F? Yeah, that's the identity. Right? You just don't draw. Does T have one to F and one to F? No, no, it doesn't. So it can't be T. It has to be F. Okay, now let's consider F and T. Whatever object serves as the product for, for F and T, it's got to have those projection morphisms down, right? It's got to have those projection morphisms down to F and T. So it's got to have a morphism to F, whatever object it is, and a morphism to T. Well, let's ask, could it be T? Could T be the product of F and T? No, why not? Does it have a morphism down to F? That's right. Let's suppose it were T and F. Could it? Could that be T? No, because it doesn't have a morphism to F. How about T and T? Could that have a product be T? Yeah, could that product be F? No, the closest upstream one is actually here. It's actually T. It's the remember we want we want the, the closest one, the one that other things go through, right? They they go through it. So not only does A cross B have to links here, it has to be sort of the close one in the pre-order. And and that would be T. So 
the product, whatever the product is, the product is a phenomenon in this category together with some production. Okay, um, so the product of F and F is F, the product of F and T is F, the product of T and F is F, and the product of T and T and T. And that gives us the rule for me. Does that make sense? Are we comfortable with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the rule of hand. Maybe, maybe we'll do it another few, and maybe you'll start to get more comfortable about that. Maybe there's something about that one that's troubling you is only two, only, you know, one, not at any arrow, et cetera. Okay, let's, let's try this thing. All right. Okay, this one. What is, so remember, we're trying to find the rule. And tell us, right? I need two objects with the product, right? Um, okay, so suppose we pick objects 15 and 10. What's the product for them? Well, it has to be an object, right? Some object. It could be one of you take the product of 15 and 10. But whatever object it is, it, it has to have morphisms to 15 and 10, right? Fine. Yeah. And so what and it, it's not just any old object, it's, it's the one kind of to which all others go through it. All others have a unique morphism to it. But uniqueness is kind of baked into this. You know, the same category, but but um, so as long as there exists, there's meaning. And so, what object could possibly 15 and 10 is the closest upstream one? It has more physics to 15 and 10, and it's the closest everything else that's upstream of them goes through it. Which one is that? Five. Okay, how about for uh, 15 and 6? Well, let's do 10 and 6. I mean, that's a little bit easier. 10 and 6 is 2. Okay, how about 15 and 6? 3. 3. Okay, and how about... Okay, so um, uh, how about 5 and 3? 1. Okay, 2 and 3. 1. Okay, how about 10 and 3? One. 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 Uh, how about ten? How about three and six? Three. Uh, one. No, three. Three. Yeah. Seven, four, three. three. In the mathematics, we, we say the largest number that is divided into number. For example, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the largest common yeah, denominator. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's the largest value here, which is going to divide both, uh, both of them, right? Um, and, and so three and six is three, three and 15 would be three as well, right? Um, three and 10 would be one, one. It's the largest one that divides both of them. So here in this category, this previous category, the product was and. Any two objects, if we computer what the object is corresponding to the product, it was given by the rule of and. Here, the rule for the product is given by for determining what object is and what structure is, is the product. The product, what I mean, we're talking about is an object, but it's it's with the cones going to them. Um, it's the greatest common divisor. I mean, greatest. I didn't. I said denominator. It's greatest common divisor. Um, what's the product in the pre order of natural numbers? Okay, so this is a pre order, right? 
Zero is less than or equal to one. One is less than or equal to two. Two is less than or equal to three. Three is less than or equal to four. So take, take two numbers, say two with three. I want to find the closest, remember, so I've got this diagram, the closest upstream one that has links to both of them, everything else comes, comes has a morphism. It's got to have at least one just to it, right? Um, and there have been you seen correspondence, but here we're looking at least for a morphism to it from, from, from the others. Uh, so what do you think every other one that that has links to A and B have to factorize through through this product. So let's take three and two. So we're looking for something that's upstream of three and two, could be one of those, that every other number that has a morphism to three and to two has to go through this number. Two, good. How about for four and three? Three. Three, good. How about for three and three? Three. How about for zero and two? Zero. So what is it? It's the minimum. The minimum of these numbers. The product is the minimum. Um, and as we'll see, the co-product is the max. All right. Um, okay, power set. Power sets. Okay. Zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two. Zero, one, three. Zero, two, three. Uh, so you recognize these arrows here are indicate conclusions, right? Um, uh, and so it's, is this, is this, uh, so it's an arrow from A to B. It's asking is set A, or, or you could say it's an assertion that A is a subset. Doesn't have to be proper, but a, a subset of, of B, right? It could be the same set. Or, uh, okay. So um so now now I'll ask. Okay, you want to find the product of let's say uh zero two and zero three. Zero. Okay. Hey, you're getting the trick. <laughs> you're trying to find the the sort of closest object upstream that all other objects that go to two and to three, that have F and G going to two and both two and three go through it, right? Um you don't have to worry about two because it only points to to this one. Okay. Um, you don't have to worry about three because then it only points to me. You don't have to worry about one because it's in the other way. It's not. But MP set points to both of them, but it's factorized by zero. It goes through zero. Zero is on the way. Zero is like the essence. It's got it. It's like the the uh, gateway to zero and three, zero and two. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, um, how about Zero one three and zero two three. Zero three. Zero. Folks are fast. Yeah. Zero three. Um. Why not three? We can say the common. It's not the closest. Yeah, it's factorized by zero three. It goes through zero three. So this gets the essence of of them. The others are just. Kind of not getting the full story, right? They're, they're only pieces of it. They all go through here. They're all subsets of this. This is yeah. So what is what is what do you think the product is here? The intersection. The intersection of these two, right? Um, we could try something from two different rows, right? How about one, two, and and zero two three. What do you think the closest is to that? Two. 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 Right? Um so uh you can look at at other objects and 
And you could say, well, why isn't it three, for example? Well, um, uh, that doesn't go to one, two. That's not upstream of one, two. There's no morphism to one, two. The product, whatever object is at its head, it means morphism to both. And three wouldn't be morphism to both, right? Uh, one, you can throw why isn't it one? Well, it doesn't have morphism to zero, two, three. Uh, but two is to both, right? So it's the intersection. Do you want to guess what the what the co-product is? The union. The union. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Pre-orders of partitions. Okay. Um, so here, partitions. This is kind of cool. This is actually quite relevant for modeling because sometimes we have models that like group. This is like. Um, Children, older adults, reproductive age adults. We might have models that some of them group this group, some group these two groups, some group all three groups. It's very aggregate, some break them all out of reproduction. And what do you think the arrows here mean? Arrows, two of the groups in the first one get put together in the second one? Yeah, it could be. You could you could say that, or just one one object because uh, is that the group? like uh, a link from A to B would be like um, B is a uh, collapsing down of A, right? Um, so it's like a coarse graining; it's going to collapse things out. So, and this one up here is downstream of all of them. This is like a collapsing ball. What do you think product is here? What would be the product of um, these first two on the left? What do you, what do you think? This one and this one. Yeah, it's like the bottom one. So if we have two models, one of which collapses reproductive age to adults and adults, and another one collapses children and reproductive age individuals. If we want a model that can at least break them out as accurately as, as all of those, at least as, as accurate, we would have to break out all three of them. So. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, like if we had C or O, the top one, and this middle one, or something, um, we would. Uh, what which what would be the product of this middle one and this top one? Mm -hmm. The middle, the middle. Um, that would be enough to kind of approximate both models or something. Um, in terms of level of, of detail, right? Um, okay, now this is kind of fun. This is kind of fun. Okay, we're back in set. Um, back in the Um, so suppose you consider, remember this is any C, right? But let's consider a specific C. Let's consider, remember what one is? That's the what object in general. Mm -hmm. object. Now it's actually the mm -hmm. terminal object. Um, and here it's the singleton set, which is the one object. Zero would be empty set. One is single to seven. Okay. So what is what is this kind of thing? Okay. Do you remember? Do you remember? So the basic property of any terminal set is what? That it has from any object in the category unique morphism into it. But do you remember in set the terminal? The, the singleton set played a special. It's, it's not thing to do with its universal property, the red model. Maybe it's a deep set of zero. But do you remember how many morphisms there are if we had a given set called S? And this is our singleton one set. How many morphisms are there in the singleton? How many functions in other words are there in the singleton and to any other set? Do you remember? 
number of objects that are in the number of uh, well elements. elements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's right. There's one for each of these. No, 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 no. There's one more system, right? It got it. You know, where does this go? go? This is got it. Uh, well, it could go there. That would be one function. It could go there. That would be another function. It could go there. and be another function. Are we okay with that? So, what is, so we say for a given function, if, if we consider one of these as if picking on a specific element, so now let's go look at this on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, so what is this morphism from one to A down here in the lower left doing? It's it's job in life is to pick out an element, pick out an element of A. Got upset A in the lower one. You mm -hmm. see that? No, it's a Sorry? Well, there's that many different values for the exciting here, but any given one of them, call it F, just like to call this, its job is like this to pick out a given A. Mm -hmm. And oh, 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 sorry, sorry. And G is picking out whatever G is. We know it's picking out a certain value of D. Probably Brendan more Brendan Fong circle them for us. Um, uh, a and it, F picks out A, maybe uh, G picks out a three, right? And remember, F and G are in a bijection H. H. Given F and G, specific F and specific G, we have a specific H. And what is the specific H is dropping? Given that the, the specific H goes from one to A plus B, what is it doing? It's picking a pair. So what this is saying is, you know, for each after G, we pick out a certain object of A, pick out a certain object. Three. We don't have to say, but if you do, for each object, for each certain thing of A and certain thing of, of, of B, we have an element, a specific element of A plus B. That's what this is saying, right? Um, that because after G, all they do is they identify the particular value of capital A, set capital A, and the particular value of set capital B. That's, that's all that we do on that. So for each specific value of A, Given by F, and each specific value B given by G, we have a specific value of A plus B given by H, right? And given any pair here and, and A plus B, then H points to that, we have a value of F and a value of G that pick those out. So it's saying, you know, a map, a map into A cross B or a value of A cross B has um, the same information content as an element of A and an element of B. Yeah. So the the, the same information. Yeah. So again, we have in A the multiple and for example, B and then. We have two elements in A and three yep. elements in B. Yep. We have the two uh, multiple like three equals six. So yep. That's, right. That's right. That's correct. And and what this is saying is that in terms of information content, it you know if you give me an element of A and give me an element B. It's the same information as I give you an element of A cross B, right? Which has the value of A and then it has the first element, the value of B is the second. Um, okay, how about Okay, what is this? What is B is the initial object? Yeah. What do you? What do you 
What do you think's going on there? It's kind of interesting. Um, well, the initial object has so it's, it's zero, yes. Uh, so so this is in any okay, so so if this is the empty object, there's a unique function here, right? Yeah. There's a unique one here, and there's a unique one here. And the unique one here is given by the composition of whatever the unique one is here and that, which is kind of vacuous. It's it's not that interesting, but because uh, you can never exercise it. Okay, how about this one? This is this is actually much more substantive um, and practical. How about taking any object um, and so we call it A and taking a product with the terminal object in, in, in a category that has terminal objects. Mm -hmm. mm. Number of elements of A, that's true. Um, that, that's true, yes. Um, so here, A, A cross one. So when we think about it, we have pi one and pi two uh, here, right? Um, uh, pi one here is going to be a, a simple matter of identity. And pi two will be mapping one onto this what? One. one. Just one. one. So it's, it's fully <laughs> it's fully determined, right? Um, but the point is a cross one is the same as a. Mm -hmm. It's the same, the same value. Um, and H here, um, uh, H will basically be encoding uh, this this mapping for F uh, going from from C to A there uh, in a um, and then having this extra element. They, believe that's the case. So let's let's think about this for set, right? Um let's think about it for set. So if we have set, let's suppose we have a set that's A, which is um I'm gonna call it lowercase a b, I'll call it F1 set because we're not I'm gonna play those up for a little case. F1 set. And now suppose we have a Cross one. What is one in set? It's terminal. Object. Right? And what is the terminal object? Let's say in, in set. The terminal object is what? It's a single set. Yeah. It's a single set. So we can call it going. It, it doesn't matter what's terrible, yeah. But what will the product of this and then look like? It'll consist of a set of what? X, yeah, and so it would be X and then what? Well, it'll be star, right? Whatever the element is here, right? That's one. That's one element in Y star and Z star, right? Oh, uh, sorry. That's okay. Good. Um, that's good. So, do you notice something about this compared to this? There's a what between them. That divides your action. It's a nice morphism. I mean, is, does this have any more information than this? Same. Same information. There's really no added information. It's not like any new information has been added in by this. This is just kind of a different phrasing of this, right? There's no added information. You ask, which one was it? All I have to do is 
if I ask which one of these is that you said the first deadline of Y, I know what the second one is. There's no, it's a given. There's no added information. So these two are small things. Really, there's the size of markets between this this object here, A cross one and A. Mm -hmm. And and then you know this this later uh, mapping down to well we know mapping to a terminal object how many how many morphisms are there going to a terminal object the terminal object what's its universal property it has one morphism so it's just a unique morphism there and this one is just an isomorphism from a cross one to a it's just the same information. Mm -hmm. Um and and you know it's it's an isomorphism such that A is composed with it is is F here. Um. Uh, so so yeah, the, it's guaranteed to be isomorphic uh, to it. Um. Yeah, and and so I, in Pascal we write the singleton object instead of the star we write it as as the given current and current and. Basically, these are the two mappings between given an A, I could create one of these with a star. Essentially, and given this with a star, I could create get the A out. It's very, very uh, straightforward. Um, okay. Um, okay, how about with the initial logic? Product with the initial logic. Let's let's think through what's going on with the initial object. How many? So let me ask you. In set. So let's think for a moment in set. How many morphisms are there into the initial object? Yeah, what, what are morphisms in set? They are functions. But this is one the ID. There you go. So what is this saying? This has to be in set. Yeah, it has it, well, we're gonna say that the normal type I2 has to be the identity, so that has to be the initial object. This has to be the initial object, which is empty set. Yeah. So in set, this has to be empty set, because otherwise there's no. There's some amorphism going to this. And so you uh uh oh okay um okay this this is uh initial object is guaranteed to be okay, yes. So uh right. So this has to be this has to be uh I think that this is true in all categories. Um and uh and then uh yeah so okay this um yeah a cross i uh has to equal i is what this is saying here um and yeah if it thinks that this is true it's, um now for for okay so here g okay from a given given category here okay so I indicated it was zero here. This is a okay, G. So G here has got to be the same as this. This is ID, so those compose. And then um so saying this is unique. Uh I think that's given by Oh yes, of course, because it's a map out of the of the initial object. This is unique. If this is the initial object, this is just the identity, and this, therefore, because this is identity, these two have to be the same. This is the this is the uh, sort of the one from an initial object to anything, and this is just a map in here. Uh, and I think. Uh, uh, yeah, th this composed with this set has to be that. So it's and and the kindness that this 
this always has to be zero. So it's like multiplication with one gives one. Well, oh, sorry, gives a times one gives a, a times zero gives zero. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So, again, I want to think that through. Okay. Product with initial object in set. Yes. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, that's right. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna um, watch. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, we, I think we may have to do more of this. We haven't even gotten to, to uh, jump rocks, but um, let, me, let me leave you with some really interesting things today. So, um, turns out the product, so if we consider, um, the set in set, this is home set, so these are all maps from, a, from an object C to an object A. And we consider all maps from C to B. Um, so we consider C. Remember up there at the top of that is C. And remember A is on the left. These are all maps. These are all maps, right? That these maps. F and G are one to one correspondence of the maps from C to A cross B. Remember that property for, for the, um, I'm, I'm sorry to go, go through this, uh, but way back here, right? That's this one to one correspondence between a pair of F and G, the maps from C to A, C to B, one of those, and M A, right? And the maps from C to A. A cross B. That's just what we we have to do. Um, and the idea is that this is this is guaranteed to be an isomorphism. And it turns out that you can show this rather nicely um, with look if you have an F and G H of X, that one mapping is just F applied to you know given X. It's, it's f for x comma g for x, right? And to go from it, um, from a map k cross b to one of these, all you do is you compose. So given one of these, h, you just post compose it, you, you do pi one after it, or pi two after it, um, to, get, to get this um, f equals that and g equals that. So it's it's uh, quite uh, the same, the same. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so next time, uh, by the way, later we'll see product categories, which are, are really cool, but we're going to, I'm not gonna show this, but next time we'll be talking about co-products. And co-products have this really nice feature of being able to say either I have an A or I have a B, but not both, I one or the other. And we call it A plus B. And it's just the dual, right? Mm -hmm. If you have in your dual category of a given category C, so in CR, you have a product, then what its equivalent is in C is a couple. And you have injection maps that stick an A in it. Uh, got an A plus B that's an A. All right, stick a B in it. I got an A plus A plus B that's a, that's a B. And it remembers which one it is. It's tagged. Tagged. Oh, this came from this person. This came from this other person. Right? And you'll notice the reps and the arrows are reversed. But Key thing is it factorizes it. You know, that it's on the way to act between A and B or any other thing. This is like the gateway to A and B. Here, the gateway kind of going, going on uh, this way, upstream from C, right? Or, or downstream from A and B. It's the closest downstream. 
Um, and it's really cool. And it turns out, well, I, I think I'll, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna um, just hit you with the essentials of it. So you either have, you know, you know, Alice has an apple and pear, and Bob has an apple and pear, and we remember, um, remember uh, both of those. Um, here we have, we remember ABC is coming from C here, you know, X, Y, Z, W, or coming from D, and, you know, any mapping into another object is factorized by this. Um, uh, so any other mapping which, which, Kind of come from these objects can be captured through this co product instead first, which which captures both of them and then um, mapped on. So this is the closest mediating downstream object from those. Um, and guess what co product will be here? Oops. Or yes. guess what co product will be here? Yes. Uh, yeah, so so the it'll be the lowest common multiple. Guess what co product will be here? Max. Max. Guess what co product will be? Uh, yes, guess what co product will be here? Remember, this was for product, it was what? Intersection for co product, it's union for um, yeah, for, so union, and I'll, I'll skip this. Guess what it is here. Well, it's clumping. Anything that's clumped, if we have these two models, anything that's clumped in them, we got a clump in the result, right? Um, anything that's mushed together, clumped together here for one of these, we say, well, we got to clump it together in the result. So now we have like, Oh man, we have one model that is these two, one model that is those two. We've got to clump all these together because we can't make distinctions among them. So we we sort of clump together as a participants. Um and uh and it turns out that it was inter with partition, yeah, you can do this. Okay. Anyway, that's um that's a kind of cool thing. Let's let's go on as plan. Um and, and there's some nice properties that are kind of similar to. The product properties if you take co product with an initial object, guess what you get? You get nothing. Do you remember product was an initial object? What did you get then? Well, just the A. Because remember, co product is either this or this, or either this or that. If you don't have that, you still have this, right? Um, Whereas product, you need both. Right? You need one from each. And you're stuck if you can't get it from one. But here, if you can't get it from one, well, you still got the ones from the other. Right? You still got Bob's apples, even if you don't have Alice. Right? Um, which is is uh kind of uh kind of cool. Um yeah, so anyway, I gave some has 